life uh, finds a way, even in the most dire of circumstances for an ecosystem, let's say a forest, even if the whole forest burns down, life can still find a way inside it. I found a very interesting study that's in the show notes about these squirrels that had evolved a different coloration in their fur, melanistic coloration in their fur, to more closely match the color of the forest after a wildfire. And the scientists found that red-tailed hawks, which eat, eat the squirrels, were, responded less frequently and less aggressively to these squirrels that had that intermediate coloration between light and dark more closely matching a forest fire. How cool is that? That's life. Ha. Huh. Jeff Goldblum. Hello and welcome to another edition of Footnotes, the companion show to Because Science, where I take all your comments, questions, and corrections and address them because my show just happens to be in that, in that butter zone where it's popular enough to get some comments, but not too popular that it gets too many comments. We're right there in mediocre land, perfectly balanced as all things should be. And then I also tell you what's coming up next on this channel, which I'm sure you're all very excited about. Speaking of which, last episode of Because Science, we were talking about why you don't actually want X-ray vision. It's another installment in the You Don't Want X Superpower series that we do occasionally. And I said, because of the problems with X-ray emission and detection and sources of X-rays in the environment, you would not want literal X-ray vision. But, what did you have to say? Our first comment comes from John Milligan who says, if you could see Wi-Fi radiation, I said that Wi-Fi vision would be a more realistic and good alternative to the classic X-ray vision. If you had Wi-Fi vision, would you be able to, you'd be the single best superhero ever, allowing people to find a strong Wi-Fi signal no matter where they were. You could become a god at airports, for instance. Yeah, imagine that superhero. Everyone, follow me. I have found a very strong Wi-Fi signal. Your timelines will load perfectly over here. Oh, thank you so much, Wi-Fi man. You helped us so we can post our photos of our lunch. No problem. Now, if you excuse me, I sense a Wi-Fi network that has a really silly name and I have to go congratulate that person because they must be very interesting. Our next comment comes from Alfredo Fontani who says, I have a question that has absolutely nothing to do with the episode. All right, you got me. <laughs> <laughs> if you were in a rotating wheel, space station, or ship, if it were turning at a speed that made me feel like I was under 1G, what would happen if I started running on a treadmill going the other way that ran the whole circumference of the spaceship or station, but at the same opposite speed that the hull is spinning, would the effects of centrifugal centripetal force be canceled out? Okay. This is a really interesting thought experiment. So one surefire way to generate artificial gravity in space is to have a rotating drum on the space station. So if you were rotated up to speed and you were on the surface of that drum as you got uh, faster and faster with tangential velocity, as your velocity changed more and more, you would accelerate towards the center, which would in fact push you out towards the hull. And if you are pushed hard enough and the hull gets in your way enough, you simulate your own weight. So it's artificial gravity. Now, what if you started run, if you were on the surface of a drum, creating artificial gravity, and you started running in the opposite direction with the exact same tangential velocity that the hull had? Well, you first have to say that if it was a giant hull that could accommodate a lot of people, the tangential velocity at the edge of the hull would be many, many kilometers per hour, much faster than a human can run. But let's scale it way down and maybe reduce the G requirement. Maybe it's 0.75 Gs instead of one. And then you can get a, a, a drum that's not too big that you can run at the tangential velocity. Now, what happens if you run at tangential velocity as the hull is spinning is the two velocities effectively cancel out, relatively speaking, relative velocity, and so you would have no changing velocity and no acceleration pointing down towards the center of the station, which means you'd go weightless. There is some scenario in which you could run in a rotating drum creating artificial gravity in space fast enough that your next step, <laughs> weightless in an artificial gravity environment. I think that would be amazing. That's such a cool thought experiment. Thank you, Alfredo. I'm just happy about it. Think of it in a sci-fi context where kids with their turbo fans and 
little race cars try to outpace the tangential velocity of the spinning station they live on and try to go weightless against each other, like as like a dare, like street racing of old. Don't steal my idea. Our next comment comes from Iron Dutch Moonshade, who says another problem with x-ray vision is that you can't see, for example, money in a safe because x-rays pass through money way easier than they pass through a safe. The same problem would exist with human skeletons behind a very thick wall made out of very heavy material, like a bunker. It would be hard to look inside a parking garage since it was made from concrete with steel wire inside. In conclusion, it is often harder to see what's behind the wall than to see through the wall. I think you're absolutely right. Another way to think about the problem with this is if you've ever gotten a medical x-ray, you know that sometimes the medical technicians will put a lead apron or blanket on you so that those x-rays will not go through the area that is being covered by that lead. What you're saying is that if you put your body in between two lead blankets, as the x-rays pass through them, it would just be absorbed by the lead, most likely. And on the other side, when you were detecting the x-rays that made it through for the bone shadow, it would be a very bad image indeed. It wouldn't just image what's inside and then not be absorbed at all by the other side of the surface. So yeah, that's a, that's a huge problem. It's almost like x-ray vision you don't want it. Our next comment comes from Shalom Sutherland, who says, have you tried turning it on and off again? No, I didn't try turning it on and off again, Jen. It's an IT crowd reference. Roy, I have a hot ear. What, you don't answer any doors? No, a closed door is a happy door. Range. But the nerdiest comment this week I'm giving to already super nerd science with Steph who says, having vision from the microwave level all the way up to infrared has some interesting powers. If you could see in the high frequency end of Wi-Fi range, much of, what, much of that would be absorbed by water, which is how microwaves work. This would mean that we would see dark patches of people's blood and muscle rather than bone shadowing. As a superpower, this could lead to some really cool powers like being able to see how much a supervillain is plotting because of blood moving towards the brain or a heightened spider sense by being able to see muscles starting to tense before someone actually moves. Maybe I don't want x-ray vision, but I definitely want microwave vision. Yes, amazing point. Second tier thinking, that's what I like. Taking what we've established and applying it just one step further for nerdery. And that is why, Science with Steph, you are a super nerd! Twice over, good job. But of course, I'm not always right. I once drank a whole cup of vinegar thinking it was water. I mean, it's not like I, it wasn't like glug glug, it was like Oop, like that. Acetic acid is not liquid water. So what did I get wrong last week? The biggest correction this week comes from a lot of people who all take issue with me even saying x-ray vision has anything to do with x-rays. Apparently, I'm in the minority of people who thought that x-ray vision had to do with x-rays. As many people point out, it's more of a catch-all term. X-ray vision is just shorthand for being able to see through stuff, and x-rays themselves have never, I don't know why I put x-rays in quotes, and x-rays themselves have never been uh, explicitly ex associated with this power. All right, uh, but a couple of things. First of all, I think if you asked 100 people what does x-ray vision involve in terms of the physics of it, and 99, of them would say x-rays. So I base my videos around the most general interpretations of things. Second of all, if you wanted to science x-ray vision, where would you logically start if it didn't have an established start for what it is or how it works? Probably x-rays. In fact, that's pretty much what every science communicator does when talking about x-ray vision. And I stand by how we evaluated it and where we went to saying there would be an alternative that you could establish x-ray vision as, Wi-Fi vision, and then you could call it that. And thirdly, even though some of you, this guy, whose name I will not say, are getting really, really salty over my interpretation of what x-ray vision is, oh, I don't actually watch fiction, I haven't gone to school, my video is completely pointless, there are a number of things in comics and pop culture which imply that x-ray vision uses actual x-ray. How about this panel involving Superman where he is detecting all the different energies in the electromagnetic spectrum, including x-rays, so he could be a detector of x-rays. 
How about this panel where Superman literally says my eyes can emit all kinds of radiation, and in this case, microwave radiation. It implies also x-rays for x-ray vision. So he's both an emitter, possibly, and a detector. Or what about this panel where Superman says the heat from his x-ray vision would melt his glasses? Oh. Or what about this panel where the nurse says Thank you, Superman, for helping us get an x-ray using your x-ray vision. You know, like how medical x-rays work. Look, I'm, I'm getting a little worked up about this, but the point is, is that there's a lot of confusion as to what x-ray vision is, and that is the point. If we're gonna evaluate x-ray vision scientifically, where do we start? I think a logical place is using x-rays and then presenting alternatives from there, which is exactly what we did. That guy, so, correction noted, but not implemented. <laughs> Our next correction comes from, okay, wait. It says, P.S. I challenge you to spell my name. You, you wrote it, it's right there. Do you mean you challenged me to say your name? Fine. Our next correction comes from oh, Saigunas Kasikowskis. Nailed it. He says, hey Kyle, first of all, I have a small correction which isn't really pointed at you, it's more general. People shouldn't refer to the 390 to 700 nanometer range as visible light range in terms of wavelengths. It's more of the human visible light range because other animals that we know of can push their sight further uh, and closer to ultraviolet radiation and infrared radiation, which I totally agree with. Insects and birds can see closer into the UV range and even some people who have their lenses removed uh, can start seeing into the UV range. It's not really seeing infrared for red, but uh, some pit vipers have evolved the ability to integrate the sensation of heat from tissues in front of their face into their visual part of their brain, and that's kind of like sensing. So, human visual range, I agree. But Saigunas also, I hope that's right, but uh, Saigunas also says, so Batman in the Dark Knight used 2G, 3G vision in his final battle against Joker. Yes, if you had Wi-Fi vision and you could turn every single cell phone on Earth into an emitter of these signals, you could use those uh, and their reflections from the wavelengths that are bouncing off everything from those phones as a way to image the environment just like Batman did. Yes, that's totally possible. And that's why Morgan Freeman wanted it destroyed. It'd be so powerful. Because Wi-Fi vision would be such a good alternative to x-ray vision. And you can't argue with Morgan Freeman. I guarantee it. He's God in a movie. Batman used his Wi-Fi vision and found the Joker. Quickly. Mm, quietly. No, that's more like Z Frank. And here we see the Katuttle fish with its squiddy squiddy body and Tenty Boys. It's my Z Frank impression. Mm. The kangaroo is a mysterious animal. Mm. Look at this right here with its tiny, tiny belly. It's pretty good. Our next correction comes from CD Reader 2 says, you may not even want Wi-Fi vision though due to the structure of your eyes. The rod and cone cells at the back of your eye would have to be significantly altered to detect that type of EM radiation and the cornea slash pupil would have to uh, be different to focus it. And you could probably see through your eyelids making sleeping a chore. In addition, you would unlikely be able to see in color as we do, as materials would reflect, absorb, or let through light differently, making you maybe colorblind in our world. Also, your brain's visual cortex would have to be altered significantly in order to take in all the information coming in, especially since you would likely be able to see backwards through your skull. And if you had a visual apparatus could detect radiation from any direction, you'd have to have all that alteration going on. But uh, hey, at least you would know of any objects around you, wait, but hey, at least you would know of any objects around you at all since you would likely have complete 360 degree vision, you creepo. But yes, you are right, CD reader. I kind of glossed over this, but to accommodate something like Wi-Fi vision or even X-ray vision using X-rays, your brain and your eyes would have to be altered significantly uh, because of the wavelengths that we are talking about here. Your eyes would probably have to get a lot bigger and weirder looking, like an anime person. And the structure of your brain would have to start interpreting signals differently because it wouldn't be like visible light anymore. So I think you're right. 
when you're right, you're right. But the nerdiest correction I'm giving to one-time super nerd, it happened again, Marcel Savigny, who says why you don't want Wi-Fi vision as a superpower. Oh. I see what you're doing. First of all, the object size is limited by the wavelengths used. As I said, you wouldn't be able to image very small objects and the detector that you're using for the Wi-Fi signals would have to be very specific because even if you disorient an antenna for Wi-Fi signals just by 30 degrees, the intensity of the detected signal drops by 62%. And sources of Wi-Fi are really more common than X-ray sources on Earth, but so easy to defeat. Let's imagine a new villain, Dr. Faraday, and you see me coming. Wi-Fi signals are so easy to control and simple to stop, and suddenly you'd become Wi-Fi blind if you had something like a Faraday cage. Yes, I suppose that just a simple mesh of metal might be able to defeat our new superpower, which would be... Lame. But for thinking about that and creating a new supervillain called Dr. Faraday, you, Marcel Savigny, are a two-time super nerd! Now, if you are already subscribed to Alpha, which you can do at projectalpha.com, you already know what the next episode of Because Science is going to be because you have already seen it two days earlier than everyone else and you get other premium content from Nerdist and Geek and Sundry. <gasps> Lucky you. But if you haven't subscribed to Alpha just yet, the next episode of Because Science is... I'm... How special. Spider sense works. That's right. In the next episode of Because Science, I'm making a confession. I have been doing this show for a long time, too long, and in that time I've been asked about spider sense and how it can actually work a lot. And I've always dismissed it out of hand saying, no, nothing can be that sensitive. But my confession is that I've never really looked into it. I'm sorry. Now that I have, I am so wrong. Spider senses are amazing, and if Peter Parker had something like real spider senses, I think we could make the comic book version work. And if you want to see me break all that down, stay tuned. Spider senses are like, they're mind-blowingly good, as you will see. So watch it. So go watch the latest episode of Because Science if you haven't yet, and leave me all your comments, questions, and corrections at youtube.com slash because science, facebook.com slash because science, and at because science on Instagram and Twitter. All of those places which I remembered, because those places are where I will be checking for comments for this show, and mispronouncing your names, and hesitating during saying lines and flubbing them. And don't forget, if it looks like a bee, if it flies like a bee, and if it buzzes like a bee, it might be a bee mimic. Nature is complicated. Wasps, flies, they all mimic bees. Things are more complicated than you think, always. Uh, it's, it's, it's unnervingly complicated. The universe will never let itself be known to you unless we science. What, what's, what's happening? What, <laughs> I gotta go. I'm losing it. It's too complicated. There's not enough time.